So to honor Women's History Month, I want to share with you the life of Helen Hamilton Gardner, born 1853, died 1925. Despite her remarkable life, I didn't know about her, neither did anyone else I asked. And why is that? That was a question that historian Kimberly Hamlin asked when working on her new wonderful book, Free Thinker, Sex, Suffrage, and the Extraordinary Life of Helen Hamilton Gardner. Rarely do I rely on a single book as much that when I construct my talks, but Gardner has been largely overlooked by history. I'm gonna focus on three periods of Gardner's life. First, I'm gonna explore how a sexual double standard forced her to reinvent herself. Second, I'll share with you how she emerged on the national stage attacking sexism in both science and religion. And third, I'll focus on the crucial role that she played in the passage of the 19th Amendment securing women the vote and how she, along with most of others supporting the cause, ignored the political rights of black women. Despite this profoundly disappointing aspect of the suffrage movement, in other ways, Gardner strove to uplift the values that we hold dear in ethical culture, evidence, reason, inherent worth, and the importance of personal relationship. I need to begin though with a story of a young woman named Alice Chenoweth. After graduating from the Cincinnati Normal School in 1873, 20-year-old Alice moved to Sandusky, Ohio on the shores of Lake Erie to begin a teaching career. Alice was a brilliant teacher. Her students performed so well that after only a year, she was promoted to become principal of, the new, of a new normal school for teachers starting up in Sandusky. Obviously, she had caught the eye of many in Ohio's educational circles, she certainly caught the eye of Ohio's 37-year-old commissioner of common schools, Mr. Charles Smart. He began visiting Sandusky more often than his professional duties required, and soon a scandalous romance between Charles and Alice was exposed in the local press. It seemed that Mr. Charles Smart did not disclose to Alice, almost two decades her younger, that he was already married with children. He was publicly criticized for this improper intimacy. The Sandusky Daily Register wrote of Smart that, quote, his conduct in the city has been a disgrace to him and to his office, and that he has destroyed the reputation of an estimable young lady. Smart blamed others, saying that he was the victim of politically motivated malicious intent. He wrote le open letters defending himself, and his reputation was wounded but not mortally. A disgraced man had many options. Alice would later write that such a man had, quote, opened to him many avenues of happiness, many paths to honorable employment. Alice, however, was labeled a, quote, fallen woman and forced to resign from her teaching position. The trope of the fallen woman was common in America in the late 1800s. It was based on a profound sexual double standard. Men could have sex outside of marriage, but for women, it was a sin. Alex explained how this double standard typically affected every woman and man. She wrote, if he were not a gentleman, it was her fault. If he took advantage of her tenderness and confidence in him, it was her fault. If he swore to all that was holy and she believed him and acted upon his word and the results were disastrous, it was her fault. For being in love and being deceived, Alice's promising teaching career died. In fact, the person known as Alice Chenoweth died. Her name disappeared from the public record. Eight years later in 1884, the person once known as Alice rose like a phoenix with a new name, Helen Hamilton Gardner. This young woman had constructed a new identity and new name. She took the names of her grandmothers, Hamilton on one side and Gardner on the other. And for her first name, she chose Helen, which meant shining light, which 
despite the crippling double standard plaguing women she aspired to be. And she would burn bright as a feminist, free thinker, speaker, author, activist, and public servant. She had grown up in a world where women had little freedom thanks to the custom known as coverture. Women were considered under the authority of men. When Helen's father died, her mother, Anne, became desperate. Work options were scarce and she was not, alone to, not allowed to own property. She was only trained to be a homemaker. In America, women were often trapped in the cult of domesticity and Anne struggled. Publications like America, American Women's Home portrayed domestic life as important and rewarding, but Helen saw her mother's life as burdened by loss, abandonment, endless drudgery, downward mo mobility, and death. Women without the protection of men were vulnerable, even the very young. They had little legal protection. In fact, years later in 1892, Helen published a book entitled Pray You, Sir, Whose Daughter, which discussed sex in Victorian America more directly than ever. It brought forward the specific issue of the age of sexual consent. In 1890, 38 states codified the age of consent as 12 or younger. In Delaware, it was seven years old. Helen laid culpability for this horror on, quote, fathers and husbands and brothers who have met in secret session and passed laws legalizing the rape of girls. She worked for years with some success to raise the legal age of consent in state after state, and few knew about her experience as Alice. As Helen, she earned praise and was nicknamed the Harriet Beecher Stowe of fallen women. Helen contrasted the label fallen women with how young men were encouraged to sow their wild oats. For women, the loss of virginity generally amounted to social, moral, and physical death if it happened before marriage. But for young men, they were expected to have sex early. For most men, poor behavior in general was excused, as it was for Helen's nephew, Ernest Chenoweth, who was kicked out of Harvard but got one second chance after the other. And it galled Helen that male adolescent sexual exploration was endorsed by parents, ministers, teachers, and even police. And the suffering caused by boys sowing their wild oats, so to speak, was ignored. And women experienced sexual trauma, sexually transmitted diseases, unwanted pregnancies, and social ostracism, sometimes death. Should women dare to admit persistent sexual urges, the medical establishment pathologized them as suffering from a newly named disease, nymphomania. Those who stifled their urges were said to suffer from another disease, hysteria. On top of that, women were denied both sexual education and birth control. The 1873 Comstock laws banned publishing or distribution of, quote, any obscene book, pamphlet, paper, writing, advertisement, circular, print, picture, drawing, or other representation, figure, on, or of, paper, or other material. So without reproductive choice, women got pregnant and often were forced to marry, often into bad marriages. Husbands were allowed to force themselves sexually on their wives. Should women resist, many men resorted to violence. Even inside the sacred marriage bond, Helen would explain, women were abused. Helen joined a movement in the 1970s advocating for voluntary motherhood and the right to review sex, refuse sex, though marital rape would be allowed for another century in our country. How could it possibly be good, Gardner asked, for women to have children before they're ready to be good mothers? It was clear to her that, quote, she who permits herself to become a mother without having first demanded and obtained her own freedom from sex domination and fair and free conditions of development for herself and her child will commit a crime against herself, against her child, 
and against mankind. Helen became convinced that only by wielding political power could women protect themselves. Men not only passed laws to hold women in bondage, but they encouraged ethical hypocrisy. Gardner wrote, a man is valued for many things, least of which is his chastity. A woman is valued by men for a few things, chief of which is her chastity. This double code can by no sane or reasonable person be claimed as woman made. So women had to make the laws. Helen also wrote about how religion propped up this de double sex, sexual double standard, and this impressed Charles Ingersoll, known as the great agnostic. He had long been an advocate for women's rights. A decade before they met, the famous Ingersoll proclaimed sexual equality and promoted egalitarian marriage in an address entitled, The Liberty of Man, Woman, and Child. He attacked religion, declaring that, as long as women regards the Bible as the charter of her rights, she will be the slave of man. Helen felt the same. Ingersoll became her mentor. Helen had expressed religious skepticism early in her life. She recalled re attending a religious revival with her childhood friend, Isabel, and both were terrified when they were accosted by a tall, thin, dark, and terrible looking clergyman who asked them, do you want to go to hell? Later, when the two girls were told that they were actually saved, the friends agreed that they didn't really feel any different despite their so-called salvation. Religion seemed like an empty sham. Maybe Helen was influenced by her older bro brother, Bernard, who had to buy two copies of Thomas Paine's The Age of Reason because their pious mother burnt the first copy. Helen's religious skepticism deepened after Bernard died at 34 without accepting the Lord as his savior and a patronizing minister told her grieving mother that Bernard would go to hell. Helen first publicly critiqued religion when Ingersoll arranged for her to join him on stage at New York's Chittering Hall in January of 1884. And due to Ingersoll's fame, Gardner got a huge crowd and the talk was a success. But even so, some reviewers continued the sexist habit of commenting more on Gardner's appearance than on the substance of her talk. And she responded to this indignity with a satirical essay titled, Lecture by a New Male Star. It was published in The Truth Seeker, and it reported on a fictional talk by a male scholar, but she focused not on the substance of the talk. Gardner commented only on the speaker's appearance, on his large luminous brown eyes and fair complexion and his shapely throat and the daintiest of feet. She learned early that humor was an effective tool. The title of Gardner's 1884 talk was Men, Women, and Gods, and in it she declared that the Bible was, quote, written by fallible men and resulted in the degradation of women for centuries. She proclaimed that every injustice that has ever been fastened upon women in a Christian country has been authorized by the Bible. That the Bible taught that a father may sell her daughter for a slave, that he may sacrifice her purity to a mob, and that he may murder her and still be considered a good father and holy man. So Helen was ahead of her time. Few people had heard a woman offer such a direct denunciation of religion. It would be another 11 years before Elizabeth Cady Stanton published her feminist critique titled The Woman's Bible. But right after the talk in 1884, the press called Gardner many things, including the female scoffer, a petticoated infidel, and Ingersoll in soprano. Paternalistic clergy called on her to convince her to mend her ways, but she turned them away. In her speech, she declared the biblical paradigms about men and women contradicted science. Genesis asserted a hierarchy of the sexes, but Gardner pointed out that in the animal world, male and female acted essentially as equals. She said that we must appreciate that science, not Christianity, was the authority as to what was truly natural. Helen learned at the Cincinnati Normal School that what was most important was not what to think, 
but how to think. Knowledge should be based on evidence, not on biblical fairy tales about women springing from Adam's rib. But Helen soon learned that the scientific community was not fully dedicated to the scientific method. It often chose, chose sexism over science. The male-dominated scientific community asserted that women were physically and psychologically unfit for higher education. In 1876, Edward Clark published Sex in Education, or A Fair Chance for Girls. And in it, he claimed that due to the physical strain of menstruation, women who entered higher education risked becoming infertile. Once this claim was debunked by Dr. Mary Putman Jacoby, the first woman to study medicine at the University of Paris, Clark switched tactics. Instead of emphasizing sexual organs, he claimed that women's brains were inferior, and he based his assertions on the work of a Dr. William Hammond, who had said that the nervous system of women would become, quote, woefully disturbed should they try to study what could not be possibly of use to them, such as algebra, geometry, and spherical trigonometry. Hammond asserted 20 physiological differences between the brains of men and women regarding their weight and density and size and more, and most people accepted Hammond's claims. Gardner did not. She knew that Hammond based his claims on assumptions and prejudice, not scientific facts and discoveries. So she sent a questionnaire leading to, lead to leading neurologists and brain scientists in New York City. And based on their responses, she declared it impossible to differentiate brains by sex. She challenged Hammond, actually. She promised to produce 20 brains from a collection of brains stored at Cornell University. And if Hammond could tell which were from men and which were from women, she'd stop criticizing. Hammond responded that his claims are based on calculating averages, not by examining individual brains, saying that this was the way all such determinations are made by those who know about what they are about. Fair enough. But he dismissed Gardner so patronizingly, saying that she demonstrated the, quote, defective logical power so characteristic of most female minds. The scientific community in America took Hammond's side. But Gardner continued to speak out. At the 1888 convention of the International Council of Women, activist Elizabeth Cady Stanton introduced Gardner by saying that, quote, the last stronghold of the enemy is scientific. Gardner followed with a talk entitled Sex on the Brain. She warned of, quote, two conservative molders of public opinion, clergymen and physician. While most women knew of Christianity's sexism, they'd hoped that science would be their friend and ally. But unfortunately, they were only met with pseudoscience. The three horsemen of misogyny, conservatism, ignorance, and egotism, rode from the scientific into the, from the, from the religious world into the scientific world. And Gardner explained, quote, when religious influence and dogma began to lose their terrors, legal enactments were slowly modified in women's favor, and hell went out of fashion. In other words, when the law began to discount religion, women began to advance. She continued, then conservatism, ignorance, and egotism in dismay and terror took counsel together and called in medical science, still in its infancy, to aid in staying the march of progress. Gardner urged women to save science from male scientists by studying science. She bequeathed her brain to Cornell University's brain collection so that people could verify the equality of brains. And she got Elizabeth Cady Stanton to promise to bequeath her brain too. In fact, Gardner wrote a little poem about what she imagined would be her external proximity to Stanton once their craniums were preserved in formaldehyde. One of, one of the verses went, corked in a decanter on a shelf so high, their brains at Cornell, their souls on the fly. Elizabeth, Katie, and Helen so small hold converse with scientists all round the wall. But it was regarding voting rights that Gardner made her greatest civic contribution and her gravest 
moral oversight. As Kimberly Hamlin admits in the prologue of the bi biography, for all her intellectual brave, bravery and iconoclasm, Gardner could not see her way through racism. Historians disagree over whether the 19th Amendment to the Constitution granting women the vote would have been ratified in 1920 had there been explicit inclusion of black women, but most suffrage leaders did not think it worth the risk. It shouldn't surprise us, I guess, that Helen, who was born in Virginia prior to the Civil War, might ignore the plight of black women in her zeal to secure the vote. Her family's comfort derived in part from the enslavement of people. Her father, Alfred, held two black people in bondage. And when he married Helen's mother, he inherited more. When Helen's father became a Methodist minister and moved to Washington to become pastor of Ebenezer United Methodist Church, a church founded by African-Americans, he decided to free those he enslaved. And for this, he was roundly criticized by those who didn't want abolitionism to start ruining their profits. And Helen clung to those family stories about her father's bravery in the face of such criticism. Later in life, she wrote a novel, An Unofficial Patriot. It's centered on a minister who frees those he had enslaved. While praising the white hero, however, Gardner gave no agency to the African-American characters in her book they seemed like a backdrop to the glorification of the white abolitionist. Kimberly Hamlin suggests that Helen may have felt immune to accusations of racism, given that she lost three brothers and her father to premature deaths related to their union service in the Civil War. Hamlin writes that Gardner, quote, seems to have felt as though her family's valiant efforts to abolish slavery excused her from having to actively engage in the ongoing struggle for African-American civil rights. Racism had infected the suffrage movement. Black luminaries like W.E. Du Bois and Mary Church Terrell were invited to speak to the National Women's Suffrage Association, but they were generally ignored. When Ida B. Wells wanted to march in her state delegation in a suffrage parade, she was told that she had to march at the back. She refused, by the way, and marched with her state caucus. The parade in question was the famous 1913 Women's March, the day before Woodrow Wilson's first inauguration. Gardner with Alice Paul planned it. They feared that inclusion of many black women would backfire. Gardner wrote, it will prevent the parade, ruin us and do nobody the least little bit of good, and least of all the Negroes. It was a huge affair, 5,000 women, music, decorated floats. The very last float in the parade was one criticizing the states where women had no vote at all. And it was emblazoned with a famous quote from Abraham Lincoln, no country can exist half slave and half free. Did the organizers miss the irony of using this liberating phrase to promote vote for white women while ignoring the vote for black women? More odious than this was the fact that to secure ratification of the 19th Amendment, Gardner manipulated bigoted assumptions and racist fears. When she spoke to President Wilson, who had many racist elements of him, she described how without his support, women would continue to have to go door to door in marginalized communities to solicit signatures. Did he really want women to be climbing dark stairways at night in buildings full of black men? By triggering Wilson's racial animus, she hoped to win his support. She used the same tactic with Mississippi Senator John Sh Sharp Williams and with other Southerners Support for the amendment, she said, or else white suffragists would probably try to activate the political energy of the black population. She asked Southern legislators with barely veiled bigotry, do you wanna force the refined white women of your state to appeal to all of the individual voters in your district? 
Senator Williams, worn down by Helen's persistent, was transparent about his racist resistance to suffrage. He explained that black women, quote, cannot be controlled as the men can be. And they would most almost all without exception go to the polls while a great many white women would not. He even clarified his racism, quote, the real reason why Negro men who do not vote in the state of Mississippi is not because they're legal disqualifications, but because they are afraid that if they do vote, they might get hurt. Violent tactics would not work on women because, quote, a woman is a woman after all, whether she be black or white. Violence against black women would backfire, he said, because the whole moral sense of the world would condemn Mississippi white men. Given racism in America, suffrage leaders simply refuse to risk their campaign by tying it to racial justice. But I wonder what the world would be like now if a hundred years ago, suffrage leaders and black Americans united. I credit Hamlin for not shying away from the racism of the suffrage movement. In writing this book, quite often authors who pour themselves into biographies over many years sometimes fall prey to historical glorification of their subject, but Hamlin didn't. But let me now focus on some positive strategies leading to the passage of the 19th Amendment. National suffrage efforts faced a huge obstacle when in 1875, the Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution did not confer the right of suffrage upon every, anyone. So activists shifted to a state-by-state -state effort. And in 1893, Colorado became the first officially to grant women to vote. And state-by-state -state efforts, though, were really slow. So when President Wilson was elected, suffragists saw an opportunity. Wilson was the first Democratic president in 20 years and was unique in being both a Southerner and a progressive. If he supported the vote for women, it might persuade enough Southerners to make it a reality. And Gardner used every tool at her disposal, including her 1902 marriage to Selden Allen Day, a Civil War hero with many friends in Congress. Armed with his address book, Helen built personal trusting relationships with powerful men. She printed up two sets of calling cards, in fact, Helen Hamilton Gardner on one and Mrs. Selden Allen Day on the other because she had learned how to use different names and different identities. When she and Day moved into 1838 Lamont Street in Washington, Gardner took advantage of the fact that her next door neighbor was Representative James Clark of Missouri, Speaker of the House from 1913 to 1918. And she played off their shared Southern roots. She had been born in Virginia and she prepared Southern cuisine for him I mean, she just knew how to make friends. The combination of political savvy, social connections, and a charming personality made her powerful. She gained access to President Wilson, became, began educating him about different suffrage organizations, information that no man seemed capable of managing. <laughs> they all got confused. There were many. There was the National Women's Suffrage Association, founded by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. There was the more radical Lucy Stone, who began the American Women's Suffrage Association. Those two organizations merged in 1890 to form the National Women's Suffrage Association. Alice Paul formed the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage in 1913. And in 1917, Lucy Burns founded the National Women's Party. And when Lucy Burns began organizing women to heckle and picket at the White House, most men simply said all suffragists were troublemakers. One politician called them all nagging iron-jawed angels and deluded creatures with short hair and short skirts. Gardner promoted herself as a responsible, refined alternative suffragist. She made friends with Mrs. Wilson, had tea with her, and made friends with the president's secretary, Joseph Tumulty. And she wrote to the president, persistently and diplomatically. And when President Wilson asked Tumulty about Mrs. Gardner, 
he was reassured that while she was a suffragette, she was not of the, quote, heckling variety. So as there were protesters who were arrested at the gates of the White House, Gardner was inside the White House advancing legislation. And she became known as Nassau's one woman diplomatic corps. Wilson was glad to have a suffragette to speak with who was not like the picketers outside, quote, this is his words, bent upon making their cause as obnoxious as possible. Helen used her connection to the president when writing to legislators outlining the suffragette's cause. She'd include all mentions of her conversations with Wilson, which led to political favors from the chief executive. As Gardner put it, she asked the president for 22 favors and he granted 21. Maud Wood Park, a co-director of the Washington office of Nassau with Gardner, explained that their success was due to Helen Gardner's gift for making friends and holding friends. When in 1913, the women's suffrage parade was delayed due to mobs of men blocking the parade, calling women unspeakable names, tripping and assaulting them, Gardner used it as evidence to prove that women needed the vote to protect themselves. She protected key legislators by inviting their wives and daughters to congressional hearings about suffrage. She planned get-togethers where suffragists and legislators could meet. Like in ethical culture, she advanced justice by creating personal relationships. When activist Carrie Chapman Catt published a new book, Gardner told her to send one to every member in Congress with a personal inscription. Because as she explained, men were twice as likely to read a book when their names were written in it. More of Gardner's tactics, were codified in a do's and don'ts pamphlet published by NASA, which included the following prohibitions. Don't nag, don't boast, don't threaten, don't stay too long, don't lose your temper, don't talk about your work in corridors or elevators, don't tell them everything you know. Gardner even got Wilson to parrot her own words when he spoke with legislators. The president told the legislators to ignore the picketers because they, quote, represent so small a faction of the suffragettes that it would be most unfair to allow their actions to prejudice the cause itself. Wilson even argued before the full Senate that the woman's suffrage was, quote, vitally essential to the successful prosecution of the great war of humanity in which we are engaged. World War I promoted women's suffrage because women became more and more necessary for the war effort. And so finally, on June 4th, 1919, the Senate voted for the amendment 56 to 25. Gardner continued her activism, pushing for the appointment of women in government. And then at 67 years old, she herself was appointed to the Civil Service Commission and became the highest ranking woman in government. It was her first full-time paid position since she was forced to leave her high school principal position 45 years earlier. And as a commissioner, she pushed for equal pay and work after marriage during the last stages of her remarkable life. So why isn't she better known? In part, it's because she still carried the burden of having been a fallen woman. Her will instructed her nieces to burn unopened all my letters, personal papers, etc. No one would understand many of the letters and papers. Do not leave them to the eyes of strangers, end quote. Gardner's biography, Hamlin, suggests that perhaps Helen wanted to bury the scandal that killed Alice Chenoweth wanted to bury that scandal with her body. She didn't want the sexual double standard that derailed her first career to tarnish her legacy. Gardner was acutely aware of the importance of legacy. While our traditional national narrative was written by men and glorified men, our founding fathers, women had to begin rewriting our national narrative. And Gardner had often said that how the nation remembered the past was more important than the past itself. 
In her last public speech titled, Our Heroic Dead, Gardner spoke of the cemetery in Arlington where her husband was buried alongside countless of other primarily male military heroes. Where are those who died for women's suffrage? She answered, quote, our Arlington is scattered over America in graves little recognized. In that final speech, she urged the audience to not forget and let us not allow our children and our children's children to forget while we continue to give our cheers for our living heroes to also mingle our tears for our heroic dead. She was heroic. Despite flaws, some minor and some great, Gardner is our hero. She lived a life full of values that we hold dear in ethical culture, evidence, reason, inherent worth, and the importance of personal relationships. With her story told, and with her brain in a vat at Cornell, perhaps Helen Hamilton Gardner and Alice Chenoweth can be reunited in a single remarkable story. Thank you.